Okay, so let's discuss the cerebellum. And these are our study aims, and they're quite comprehensive, but um, I'm going to try and avoid going into too much detail and focus on sort of, you know, um, need to know physiology that will help you as a clinician. So, brief overview um, the cerebellum is the second largest part of the brain, it's about 10% of the entire mass of the brain. The other two parts being the brainstem and the cerebrum. But despite the fact that it's only about 10% of the mass of the brain, it actually has more than half of all the neurons of your brain. Um, reason for that is the cerebellum is a fairly ancient structure in terms of evolution. It has more time to ha it has had more time to develop, and it has had a chance to pack itself with all those uh, scrumptious neurons. It has 60% more surface area than the cerebrum, despite being so small, and it's because it has many parallel slender folds. Uh, in the cerebrum, we call the folds gyri, but in the cerebellum, we call them folia. And there's some fissures in the cerebellum. There's an anterior and a posterior fissure, and it divides it into three lobes. The anterior lobe, which is also sometimes called the paleocerebellum, the old cerebellum and it seems to be more specialized for interpreting sensory information. The posterior lobe, or the neocerebellum, the new cerebellum, 
more involved in, uh, seems to be more involved in planning motor output and the floccul flocculonodular lobe also known as the archicerebellum also known as the vestibular cerebellum archicerebellum means ancient cerebellum vestibular cerebellum meaning it takes input from the vestibular system and the vestibular system is concerned with balance so this uh, particular lobe seems to be especially involved with balance and equilibrium the names are uh, the of uh, archi, paleo and neocerebellum are chosen because uh, they seem to have developed at different stages uh, in terms of evolution of the archicerebellum being the most ancient um, and then the paleocerebellum next and neurocerebellum being the newest part of the cerebellum to have involved there are multiple cells in the cerebellum but um, for the sake of this discussion we're going to only focus on two, two of those cells uh, the common, most common cells, the granule cells uh, which are the most common out of all the cerebellar types and uh, the large distinct um, Purkinje cells which are um, the second most sort of common type uh, of cell in the cerebellum they're divided into right and left hemispheres so there's a right cerebellum hemisphere and a left cerebellar hemisphere in the same way that the right and left cerebrums have a bridge called the corpus callosum between the two um, the cerebellum also has a bridge and this bridge we call the vermis and then there's the um, cerebellar cortex which has grey matter and there's also some deep nuclei in the cerebellum kind of like the basal ganglia in the cerebrum being this uh, bits of blobs of grey tissue buried in the white matter cerebellum also has bits of grey matter buried uh, within itself called the deep nuclei and um, input into the cerebellum goes straight to the cerebellar cortex and all output goes out via the deep nuclei so soon information going into the cerebellum goes straight to the cortex that the cerebellum wants to communicate with any other part of the body or the brain it has to send signals by, uh, through the deep nuclei there's another sort of functional division um, of the uh, of the cerebellum besides dividing it anatomically into anterior posterior and flocculonodular yeah, lobe you can also div um, divide it in terms of its function um, and this uh, we can divide it into uh, or we can define a region of the cerebellum which we call the spinocerebellum and that consists of the anterior lobe um, plus um, the bits of the posterior lobe but specifically the vermal and the paravermal parts of the posterior lobe so those bits that are near the, um, the vermal bridge and this region referred to the spine as a spinocerebellum and it plays a role in receiving sensory information and regulates muscle tone so it makes sense the anterior lobe is involved in interpreting information coming in posterior lobe is involved in motor output we can combine those functions um, to um, create a sort of part of the brain that is there just to regulate muscle tone depending on the information that's coming in and that's the spinocerebellum so the cerebellar nuclei are uh, there's four pairs of them so there's four on each lobe so each lobe has a vestigial nuclei, a globus nuclei, a boliform nuclei and a dentate nuclei although the globus and emboliform tend to work together and uh, they're quite close together and they're sometimes referred to as interposed nucleus especially uh, since they tend to work in a pair anyway um, it's sometimes easier to think of them as a unit as I mentioned on the previous slide all output is via the nuclei um, the vestigial nuclei is specialized to regulate um, uh, lower motor neurons of the leg um, so it sends out tracks to the synapses of the lower motor neurons regulating how they respond to upper motor neurons and the way it does this is via the reticular spinal tracts and the vestibular spinal tracts reticular spinal tracts being the um, tracts that regulate tone and posture so that makes sense um, they synapse with the, upper, um, with the corticospinal tracts at the lower motor neuron regulating the tone and posture of the muscle 
innervated by the lower motor neuron, vestibulospinal being responsible for equilibrium and maintaining balance. Um, so um, if you're losing a balance, the vestigial nuclei can uh, send signals through the vestibular spinal tract, helping you keep uh, your balance. The interposed nuclei, they control flexor, um, flexor parts or fl uh, yeah, flexor parts of the limbs. So all the lower motor neurons that control um, uh, flexor parts of the limbs, and they work by directly uh, influencing corticospinal tract. So unlike the vestigial nuclei that uh, regulates them uh, through specialized tracts, the interposed nuclei actually directly affect the corticospinal tracts to affect the flexors um, of the limbs. Then the dentate is the biggest nuclei of all these nuclei and probably does the most work out of all of them and it has a general function of coordinating movement and coordinating speech. Um, it works by affecting the corticospinal tract so it has um, outflow to the thalamus and to the precentral gyrus to affect the functioning of the corticospinal tracts at their origin. It also um, synapses with brainstem nuclei um, to affect the functioning of the cranial nerves and to also um, synapse with interneurons um, that form in the corticospinal tracts. So zooming into the cerebellar tissue, um, there's two major cell types in the cerebellum, the granule cells which are glutaminergic and that was excitatory and the Purkinje cells which are gamma-nergic, that's gamma-aminobutyric acid, in other words they're inhibitory. And the main sort of output of the cerebellum is through the Purkinje cells. So the cerebellum tends to send inhibitory signals as part of the output. And then axons going into and from the cerebellum has special characteristics. So the histologists have given them special names. Uh, the ones I need you to know about are the climbing fibers and the mossy fibers. And uh, these fibers take excitatory in input, usually glutaminergic input, into the cerebellum. Mossy fibers uh, being the main pathway into the cerebellum. However, your climbing fibers, although they're not the main input pathway, they are the ones that involve the learning motor skills. So without climbing fibers, you'll not be able to learn new motor skills uh, via the cerebellum. And climbing fibers always originate in the opposite um, uh, inferior olivary nucleus of the pons, which means that um, the inferior olivary nucleus and those climbing fibers in the cerebellum are all intimately involved in the learning of new skills. Um, if you've studied your basal ganglia notes, you probably know the basal ganglia is also involved in learning new skills. The exact relationship between the basal ganglia and the cerebellum in learning new skills is um, still not quite clear, although the cerebellum seems to be focused more on learning um, reflexes and uh, automatic movements um, um, for example uh, punching and throwing and climbing uh, the kind of things that you don't really think about as you're trying uh, to do them but it's a difficult distinction to make and hopefully in the years to come uh, more information will be uh, revealed as to how these structures interact with one another for the learning of uh, motoric skills the blood supply of the cerebellum is um, supplied by three arteries, the superior cerebellar artery, anterior, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And um, about 3% of all strokes involve the cerebellum, and they mainly involve the cerebellum by blocking one of those three um, arterial supply routes. If, uh, if the stroke involves the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, that's um, generally causes the worst kind of stroke. Uh, can be very disabling if not lethal. Um, although the anterior inferior cerebellar artery also supplies part of the pons, so it appears that uh, the damage from the stroke is not just due to cerebellar damage, but also due to damage to the pons. Posterior inferior cerebe cerebellar art, uh, infarcts are second worst, and superior cerebellar infarcts um, are are the um, least worst. 
Sometimes they cause very few symptoms, sometimes they don't cause any symptoms at all um, because the anterior inferior and posterior inferior cerebellar arteries are able to uh, maintain blood supply um, in some patients even in the absence of supply of blood from the superior cerebellar artery. Okay, so the cerebellum doesn't just hang in space, it's connected to the brainstem with uh, stalks and these stalks we refer to as the cerebellar peduncles. The inferior peduncle connects the cerebellum to the medulla oblongata and this peduncle is the main route of entry for input uh, from the spine into the cerebellum, specifically the spinocerebellar tracts. The middle peduncle uh, connects uh, the cerebellum to the pons and this is the main route of input from the brain into the cerebellum and the superior peduncles connect to the midbrain and uh, this peduncle is the main route of output from the cerebellum into the brain. Okay, so a brief overview of the cerebellum function and then we're going to look at specific functions. Um, the cerebellum is an uh, evolutionary, very old structure, much older than the uh, cerebrum and has evolved many roles and it's hard to sort of pinpoint a specific function of the cerebellum and there's constantly new research being done into the cerebellum um, revealing new aspects of the way it functions. Um, but overall uh, it appears to be involved in the regulation of movement especially and in the interpretation of sensory input and it appears to um, um, mainly regulate um, movement for a three-dimensional environment and interpretation of stimulus, uh, stimuli from a three-dimensional environment. So a lot of the, um, the cerebellar functions are about movement, tracking objects through three dimensions, um, uh, interpreting sounds coming out of three dimensions, etc. Okay, so this is a more specific list of the specific functions of the cerebellum go over it one by one. On the top of the list we have muscle movement modulation. Now what the cerebellum does is basically compares um, the plan of movement being made in your precentral gyrus uh, with its execution. Now it actually checks that um, the movement is being followed, is being uh, made correctly. So if your precentral gyrus sends a signal to your arm to raise your arm up in class to ask a question, your cerebellum is going to compare the position of your arm with the plan of movement and make sure that the arm doesn't deviate away uh, from the plan, uh, planned movement. It will make small little changes to make sure that the arm stays on course. So it's almost like a, a ship's captain making small adju adjustments to the ship's path so it can stay on, on route. Cerebellum is involved with uh, sensory interpretation, especially from the fingertips. Um, there's some spatial perception involved in cerebellum, so the ability to um, sort of put, um, understand the position of objects in three-dimensional space, uh, space is partly responsible, um, it's partly the responsibility of the cerebellum. Um, your cerebellum is able to understand the different sides of the same object. Um, so if I put um, something in front of you, let's say make it a hat, and I ask you to close your eyes and I turn the hat around and then you open your eyes, you will, you will instinctively realize that's the same hat just from a different um, direction. So the cerebellum is able to make a sort of three-dimensional model of how things would look from um, different um, directions. Whereas some patients of cerebellar lesions, um, if you do the same experiment where you put a hat in front of them, they close their eyes, you turn the hat around and they open their eyes, they might state that this is a completely different hat. This is not the same hat that they were seeing before because they've lost the ability to um, think of the two different viewpoints of the same object um, and relate them to each other to make it uh, to make themselves understand this is actually the same object to them. If you have two different viewpoints of, uh, of uh, the same object, they interpret it as being two completely different objects. Uh, cerebellum uh, is also a timekeeper. It estimates um, how much time has passed. Uh, cerebellum is responsible for rhythm. 
uh, cerebellum uh, calculates the uh, trajectory. So if you're trying to catch a ball or if you're hunting a rabbit that's trying to run away from you, the cerebellum will calculate more or less where that ball or that rabbit is going to uh, go in the next few moments. Uh, the cerebellum coordinates where you are looking while your body is moving. So if you are running and um, um, and trying to look at a specific object at the same time, let's say you, uh, while you're chasing the rabbit, um, the cerebellum is going to coordinate um, the vision of that rabbit with your body movement so that your eyes stay fixed on the rabbit. If it wasn't for the cerebellum, you'd struggle to keep your gaze uh, focused on the rabbit while you are moving. Cerebellum is responsible for uh, distinguishing between different pitches or different tones. So it's responsible for music, and the environment is probably responsible for being able to hear, the, um, distinguish between different cries of animals, and also be able to detect um, changes uh, in sounds um, from the approach of predators uh, and so forth. Related to that, the cerebellum is necessary to distinguish between similar sounds and or words. Um, so it's a language function of the cerebellum. For example, people with cerebellar lesions might struggle to tell the difference between rabbit uh, and rapid. Uh, so to pe for people with functioning cerebellums, those words sound completely different. Um, but without a cerebellum, um, those words might sound exactly the same. The cerebellum coordinates uh, sounds and words in response to um, a stimulus. In other words, um, if you someone sticks a pin into your foot, you might say, ouch. Uh, it's partly the cerebellum's um, uh, response. Cerebellum is responsible for planning, which I suppose is part of the timekeeping function. It's able to, uh, it, you need it to be able to sort of think forward into the future and, uh, and put tasks together related to that is scheduling. Um, which, uh, which I suppose is the same thing as planning, because planning is really scheduling a sequence of tasks to follow one after the other. And the cerebellum also has emotional uh, functions. It's uh, responsible for impulse control. Um, and some ADHD patients, and those attention deficit hyperactivity disorder patients, have uh, small uh, cerebellums. Not all of them, but some of them do and that probably contributes to a lack of impulse control. It's responsible for controlling our emotions. So people with uh, cerebellar lesions um, lose their impulse control. They might become compulsive gamblers or alcoholics. Uh, they might have emotional outbursts of rage uh, uh, or inappropriate behavior. Um, they lose the ability to um, um, control um, themselves and to understand when is appropriate to do something and inappropriate to do something. Cerebellum is required to focus your attention on uh, on something. It's also required for skill learning and retention of those skills. Um, related to that, cerebellum is involved with conditioning. Um, so if you um, are constantly conditioned uh, to do something um, at a at a specific response, the cerebellum is involved. Uh, so let's say. Um, Whenever you hear a gunshot, you sort of um, immediately run for cover because you've been in many such situations and that's your immediate sort of reflex is to die for cover. Um, then that could be a function of your cerebellum. Uh, on the other hand, people that aren't used to hearing gunshots might be a little bit startled and look around and, wondering and wonder what's happening because they don't have that reflex to dive to the ground and look for cover. Cerebellum has a role in creating memories, especially memories that involve vision and what you've seen. And it also has a role in verbal memory, and that is re remembering what you heard. And all these functions um, are still not quite clearly understood. There's uh, still a lot of research being done into the cerebellum, and a lot of these functions have only been recently discovered. The problem with the cerebellum is that the tissue is so densely packed it's sometimes difficult to uh, separate um, one function from another. Um, so it's, uh, there's a distinct possibility that uh, more functions could be added in future or uh, our understanding of the different functions um, might change um, with time.
So when think of the cere uh, when thinking of the cerebellum, I like to think of the uh, of birds and how they have to fly smoothly through three-dimensional environments. Um, and you can also think of it as the predator brain, as a uh, specifically designed to be able to hunt and chase um, other creatures um, in order to make them dinner. So let's go through all the functions and see how how it relates um, to to um, to birds. I mean, first function is muscle movement modulation, and obviously, if you're flying through the air or if you're chasing an animal through the jungle, you need to be able to rapidly um, um, figure out whether your movements and the plan for your movements is um, is correct. Um, for finger, uh, next function is fingertip tactile interpretation. So whether you have claws. Um, or hands. Uh, once you uh, caught your creature uh, that you want to make dinner, um, you need to be able to rapidly gain information about it, whether it's trying to um, squirm out of your claws or your hands um, and so forth. So um, you need to interpret three-dimensional objects from different directions. Obviously that's going to be, um, be quite useful if you're chasing a creature from the jungle. It's darting in and out of the roots and you're able to immediately recognize it's actually the same creature just from a different um, angle. If you're hunting, you, s you sometimes need to um, wait for the right moment. You need to be able to time your attacks. So if your partner hunters, um, in if you're an eagle, you need to swoop down at the right moment. So it's useful to have um, a timekeeper in the cerebellum. And then obviously you need to plan and schedule your hunt and schedule the events um, that's um, going to go forth uh, as you're hunting need to control your impulses, you need to wait for the right moment before striking out and uh, grabbing uh, whatever's going to be for dinner. Uh, so that explains why the cerebellum is involved with um, impulse control and emotional control. Um, cerebellum is involved with predicting trajectories, obviously extremely useful if you're an eagle and uh, you're flying down and a rabbit is running away, you need to um, calculate your own trajectory in a, uh, as well as the trajectory of the rabbit in order to be able to get uh, uh, into this uh, spot where you can grab the rabbit. And obviously while you're moving through the jungle or through three-dimensional space, um, you need to be able to keep your eyes on the prey uh, so the cerebellum will coordinate the gaze while your body is moving. You need to be able to hear different pitches and tones so you understand. Uh, you can recognize all the different cries of the, all the different creatures. Um, if you're... Um, if you're a creature that's being hunted, you need to be able to hear the, the predator coming at you. If you're a predator, you need to be, um, be able to hear for clues um, where the prey might be. And um, obviously, if you're a hunter, you need to learn the skills of hunting. Uh, so the cerebellum is also involved with um, skill learning. If you're, uh, if you're rather the prey, you need to be able to... Um, uh, learn skills through conditioning that if you hear the cry of an eagle you quickly run into your burrow and escape uh, from the eagle and um, obviously you need to remember where the best hunting spots are um, so um, cerebellum is also involved uh, with the creation of memories so all the functions of the cerebellum in the previous slide you can actually relate it to um, how birds operate or how predators operate especially um, as they move through three dimensional environments trying to track down um, creatures in order to make their dinner okay so the cerebellum has two main modes into for influencing our movement um, and these modes have been named the feedback and the feed forward mode. Feedback mode, uh, basically what happens is that when you move your arm or leg, um, some information is sent to the cerebellum regarding what position that uh, limb or p uh, body part is in. And then the cerebellum then compares it to information coming from the precentral gyrus to make sh and decides whether the, um, the body part is doing what the precentral gyrus is asking it to do. If it's not uh, doing what the precentral gyrus uh, is asking it to do, then the cerebellum will then um, feed back into the precentral gyrus some corrective information saying, okay, move the body part a little bit to that direction, that direction, um, in order to get um, the body part in line with the original plan. So, 
you, if you think about it, if you want to move your arm smoothly in front of you, um, the cerebellum is con constantly compare where your arm is with that plan of movement. If you don't have a cerebellum, if you uh, have a cerebellar lesion or a cerebellar stroke, then you will lose the ability to compare the plan of movement with the position and space and therefore your arm will tend to wobble around um, back and forth instead of going in a smooth motion because you won't have that um, feedback that fine tunes uh, your movement. Feed forward however is a separate mode and that's for learned movements and it's especially for ballistic movements or very rapid movements in other words and these are movements where everything moves so fast that there's not actually time uh, to make a feedback loop. Uh, we need to, in other words, dump a motor movement plan and we're going to um, activate that plan and we're not going to have, um, change anything about it once it's running. And obviously um, it can o uh, such a plan has to be learned beforehand so it can only work well in well rehearsed movements so if you're a tennis player and you're constantly practicing your tennis serve uh, if you're studying martial arts and you're practicing your punches uh, rehearsing those movements enough times will create a plan of movement in the cerebellum um, and then uh, the cerebellum will be able to activate that plan in an emergency or in a situation where you have to carry out that movement very rapidly without a chance to really correct um, that movement. So it's almost uh, like the cerebellum dumps a plan of movement into the precentral gyrus or program of movement and the precentral gyrus just fires it off and there's no possibility once it's fired uh, to correct it. So now the problem with that is that um, if you're trying to serve it, um, a ball in tennis or if you're trying to throw a punch, if you make even one small mistake in the beginning, you're sort of helplessly, uh, you're sort of left helplessly watching yourself making the mistake. And even though you're aware of the fact you're making a mistake, there's nothing you can do. Um, you either serve a foul if you're playing tennis, or your punch goes uh, in the wrong, uh, in the wrong place or the wrong spot. Um, uh, because you cannot correct the movement once the plan has fired off. Just to re-emphasize the relationship between the cerebellum and the other structures of the um, uh, motor system, we've got our pyramidal tract over here. So pyramidal starts at premotor and goes all the way down to lower motor. Everything else is referred to as extrapyramidal. So the cerebellum is an extrapyramidal structure. Now, what um, the cerebellum does is it takes information from the other motor neuron as well as information from the spinal cord and it compares information. Okay, so here we have a plan to lift our arm upwards. Now, what's happening to the arm? Is it going upwards? Is it going uh, um, downwards? Is it going left? Is it going right? Is it going in the right direction? Wrong direction? What's happening? Um, for the arm. So we've got the spinocerebellar tracts giving information here and some of the upper motor neurons uh, synapse in the brainstem and some interneurons uh, then feed into the uh, cerebellum. And the cerebellum then compares these two uh, sources of information um, and then decides, okay, well the arm is not f exactly in the position that our precentral gyrus wants it to be. So we need to correct the information coming out of the precentral gyrus and correct the course of the arm so that it actually goes in the right place. So the cerebellum then sends a corrective plan via the thalamus back to the precentral gyrus, which then alters the expression of the upper motor neurons, um, altering the path of the hand so it follows uh, the correct pathway that was originally intended. Okay, so the most common cause of cerebellar depression is probably alcohol intoxication and I like to discuss alcohol intoxication because it gives you a quick um, rundown of all the symptoms of a dysfunctional cerebellum. Uh, so how does alcohol work? It um, potentiates uh, gamma or gamma amino butyric acid um, it increases its activity and gamma amino butyric acid is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and in others by increase in, um, making its effect more, we, inf uh, we increase the inhibition and therefore the brain is depressed in function, it's inhibited in its function. Now, um, 
Because of the high density of neurons in the cerebellum, a little bit of alcohol goes a long way in uh, shutting down all those neurons. If you think about the brain, the neurons are a little bit further apart, it's not as dense. Um, a molecule of alcohol has to really run up and down to knock out those neurons by uh, um, potentiating GABA. Whereas because of the high density of neurons in the cerebellum, a little drop of alcohol uh, can whack out a whole bunch of neurons all at once um, quite easily because it doesn't really have to travel far. Um, so the cerebellum is, quite, uh, is more sensitive to the effects of alcohol co uh, compared to the cerebrum. And uh, drunk people tend to lose the cerebellar function before they lose their cerebral function. And therefore the symptoms of drunkenness are initially cerebellar symptoms. You have difficulty moving through three dimensions. Um, uh, so you stumble and fall. Uh, loss of pitch and tone. Um, so your speech is slurred and not very nice to hear. Um, as loss of motor coordination also uh, encourages a slurred speech. Um, cerebellum has memory storage functions. So there's loss of memory due to alcohol intoxication. Um, there's decreased ability to process sensory input, which is why people who are drunk seem to be less sensitive to pain and less sensitive to cold. Uh, you'll find, especially if you do a lot of shifts in emergency units, uh, the drunk patients can have very serious injuries and yet they don't seem to feel any pain and they might even argue with you and demand to go home because they feel fine even though their leg is half chopped off. The cerebellum is responsible for emotional inhibition and uh, impulse control, so you lose that inhibition uh, w um, uh, and therefore drunken people uh, do stupid things like take off their shirt and dance on tables. There's a decrease in uh, ability to uh, predict trajectory and also decrease ability to um, relate yourself to three-dimensional space, so a decrease in spatial abilities, which explains also why drunk people have trouble walking in a straight line, um, that more, it's more easy for them to fall, and especially it's dangerous for them to drive because they actually have decreased ability to uh, compare their position inside the car and the car itself to objects around them. They have decreased ability to predict what path the car is going to travel, and they have decreased ability to properly assess the uh, uh, and relationships between three dimensions, uh, between objects in three dimensions. There's loss of gaze coordination, meaning that you can have blurred vision because there's not uh, no longer cerebellar coordination of the eyes. So well, that's uh, also partly due to suppression of the brainstem uh, reflexes for the gaze. But um, the cerebellum uh, inhibition uh, plays a part in that. Is a decreased ability to hold attention, so the cerebellum is necessary for holding attention. So drunk people um, uh, will struggle to solve complex mathematical formulas, and uh, drunk people also uh, engage in poor planning um, and poor scheduling of tasks. Um, so then um, they forget what they're trying to do. Um, they're not able to do complex things, and uh, it's actually dangerous for them to allow them to do complex things like such as driving a truck or uh, a tractor or something like that. And they also have poor completion of visual spatial tasks. So if you tell them, um, if you get a couple of balls and say juggle these balls, that requires a lot of um, coordination between the vision and uh, your ability to understand the position of things in space, they'll struggle to juggle, they'll struggle to complete anything uh, requiring coordination between the eyes and your orient spatial orientation. And indeed, if you have a cerebellar lesion from cerebellar stroke, you can develop any of these symptoms. Um, and that's why people with uh, cerebellum lesions um, often have this almost drunken-like movement or drunken-like drunken symptoms um, uh, to their uh, diseases. And I'm sure the neurologist will discuss that in a bit more detail. I've added a few YouTube videos there of... Um, some real-life patients uh, that have cerebellar lesions and um, although they're not drunk I want you to notice the fact that all of them uh, stagger around as if they are drunk uh, so that you can um, reinforce the, uh, the, um, that idea in your mind of um, cerebellar dysfunction giving you this almost drunken-like um, symptomatology. And remember that the 
tests for alcohol intoxication um, and the tests for cerebellar dysfunction are often the same. So um, in some uh, places, policemen are trained to uh, do cerebellar testing on uh, people to check whether they have um, alcohol intoxication. So that will be things like walking in a straight line, uh, touch, trying to touch the tip of their nose, and various other activities of moving through three dimensions um, that are lost uh, due to alcohol intoxication. Okay, so with new research coming out uh, with functional MRI studies, it's been found that different parts of the cerebral cerebellar hemispheres um, are specialized for more um, uh, more specific functions. And so let's go through the functional sort of map of the cerebellum. We've briefly touched on it before. Um, let's go through another couple of things that have been recently discovered. The lateral parts of the posterior um, cerebellum seem to be involved with um, cognition uh, and others with understanding. They, they have a, as yet unclear role in um, consciousness. Uh, we know that when you're trying to understand something, those parts of the brain uh, light up on functional MRI scan. Uh, when you're thinking about something, they light up. And that people with lesions of the lateral posterior cerebellum develop thought process problems. They might struggle to pay attention. Uh, they might struggle to... Um, uh, to think their way through problems, um, that sort of thing. It's still not very well defined, and hopefully that will be cleared up within the next uh, few years of research. The anterior cerebellum, if there's a deficit there, you can have, uh, if there's a lesion there, uh, there's some motor deficit, so there's difficulty in processing uh, motor uh, responses. And the inner parts of the cerebellum are involved with emotional processing. They have some role to play uh, with emotions, and lesions over there can cause emotional abnormalities. And just like the cerebrum is lateralized, the cerebellum is also lateralized. The right hemisphere is more uh, involved with verbal, memory, and language, and um, anything that can be broken down into smaller parts. And the left hemisphere is more for um, holistic processing um, and visual spatial processing. Note that this is the opposite of the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the left hemisphere that's involved with language, and the right hemisphere that's involved with visual spatial processing. So the cerebellar hemispheres are swapped around, as it were, um, in opposition to the cerebrum. And then the ipsilateral hemisphere will be involved with motor learning from the ipsilateral hand. So if you're trying to learn how to do something with your right hand, um, the right cerebellar hemisphere is going to be involved in learning that skill. And if you're trying to learn something with your left hand, the left cerebellar hemisphere is going to be learn, uh, involved in learning that skill. So let's say you're trying to learn how to play the guitar. The guitar, you usually hold it so that um, the frets are on your left side. Uh, and so you do all your chords um, with your left hand, and you do the strumming uh, with your right hand. So uh, in that case, your right cerebellum is going to learn how to strum, and your left cerebellar hemisphere is going to learn all the chords for your uh, guitar playing. This is a, um, another sort of map of the cerebellum. Some studies have shown that different parts of the cerebellum tend to be involved with um, specific body parts. And what we're looking at here um, is the cerebellum from a lateral view. And there's the medulla, pons, midbrain, and the colliculi. Here's our cerebellum, our anterior lobe, posterior lobe, and the flocular, flocular nodular node with the um, anterior fissure over there. Now, um, remember that the, um, this uh, middle part over here, um, connecting the, uh, what you won't see is the part that's connecting the two hemispheres called the vermis. Um, the part sort of most near uh, this middle part are called the paravermal part. So what we're actually talking about is the spinocerebellar um, area of the um, cerebellum. And you'll see that the parts that are specially um, specialized um, for different parts of the body are all over here at the parasolvermal regions, not sort of deep uh, further away from the vermal regions. And the specific body parts that tend to be um, have somatotopy in the cerebellum are your um, arms, 
your hands and your fingers and your lower legs. So there's regions for the lower legs and there's multiple regions actually and there's multiple regions for the arms and the fingers um, have a special region that actually crosses over from anterior to posterior um, lobes and then there's parts for your mouth and your lips. So those are uh, particular sort of motoric parts um, that uh, um, that there are specific regions uh, which are specialized for dealing with those um, places and say you have a lesion um, of the cerebellum over here you might lose cerebellar function in the fingers if you have a cerebellar lesion here for example you might lose cerebellar function uh, for the mouth and the lips and those are my references and this was lecture was a bit more of a challenge than usual to prepare um, but luckily I had these great some great references to help me out.